Also welcome Windy City Bulls head coach Henry Domerson to the Basketball Podcast. Domerson was hired as an assistant coach for the Maine Red Claws in 2017 and then moved to the Windy City Bulls as an assistant coach in 2018. He was promoted to a player development coordinator for the Windy City Bulls in 2020. He also held the role of player development coordinator with the Chicago Bulls during the 2020-21 season and also served as assistant coach during the Bulls NBA Summer League. Don Monsant joined the coaching ranks after a lengthy playing career overseas, including stints in Turkey, Greece, Russia, and Italy, before returning to the United States to play a season with the Idaho Stampede of the NBA Development League. As a player, Don Monsant found success nearly everywhere he went, winning a combined nine tournament and league championships during his career. Henry, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And this, I feel like it's been a long time coming with our back and forth, but I'm grateful to be here. Well, we're grateful to have you here. And, you know, I, in researching you, obviously the coaching career and everything with it, and one heck of a playing career, all those experiences playing overseas, different places, different coaches, it must have made an impression on you. Definitely. I, I'm i fortunate to be, a, be able to learn from so many great teachers. I've seen basketball, I guess, coached and played a lot of different ways. And I think it definitely impacted me as a player, but also as a coach, because, you know, I think I like to think that I have an open mind and know that, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? There absolutely is. And, you know, part of that career too was a tremendous amount of winning and being a part of a lot of winning programs over there, you know, not necessarily normal (laughs) when I look at a lot of bios of coaches that have played a lot overseas. So what what was some of the keys to the winning? I guess uh, playing, like, like I said, playing for some great coaches. I was fortunate to have some really talented teammates and, you know, I just, I, I really believe I just got put in some good situations, thank God. And I was fortunate to have some success. No, absolutely. And, you know, we're going to dive into it. You know, Windy City Bulls head coach and certainly been around the game. So I thought we'd take this time, especially because a lot of coaches are just starting their in season and their games to be able to go through some of the in season things that uh, kind of were valuable to you and uh, as a player and obviously as a coach now as well. So let's start maybe with pregame meetings and preparation. And uh, do, do you have a particular pregame structure that you like in terms of your interactions with players and your coaching staff? You mean day of game pregame? Pre-game, day of uh, game. Yeah, I mean, we have, you know, the typical whenever pre-game starts. And, but pri- I guess prior to that, we you know, shoot around and, you know, the typical schedule. But as far as meetings go, I think the day of the game, we try to have most of the work done. And it's more just focused on, on the team and making sure the pl- players come first in our philosophy. So making sure, you know, we have our shooting times and, we like to use the shooting times or pregame as development because that's the one consistent time you can count on in the G League. And so it may be 15 minutes, but it's not just, you know, some people say, oh, we just want our guys to get a rhythm or feel good for the game. Well, typically we try to use it as a, that 15 minutes to develop our guys and really focus on the big goal or our main mission. And that is so, you know, everyone is better players and better people when they leave. So we really use that time to invest. So we may talk about like, what can we do developmentally that maybe translate to both that can help in this game, but also develop the player. I think that's the main thing we communicate besides obviously the scouting report, personnel, things of that nature, but it's really about the players and it's really about how can we foster, foster a healthy environment for growth. So you may have already at the beginning of the podcast said the most important thing coaches need to hear, because I'm not sure how much high school or AAU basketball you've watched recently, but I just look at so many opportunities for coaches to be able to do development because we're all limited and restricted by gym access and gym time. And I see these pregame warmups that are just honestly a waste of time. Uh, You know, uh, it's not like, again, traditional layup lines, blah, 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 but like I counted it, my daughter, like in a five minute warm up, touched the ball and shot the ball three times. I mean, like, wh- that's I've not development. So talk here. to us about that a little bit more. Like that philosophy seems to be something that I think I would encourage youth coaches, especially to take that time and develop their players. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you know, especially in the G League, there's so much up and down. Travel is is unique sometimes and so many other things. But, you know, you're going to have a game and you'll have those 15 minutes or whatever time you slot for those individuals. And we don't want to, you know, we want to maximize that. And however we can, however we, each individual player is different, right? 
And like I said, if we can get dual implication, I guess, and it can help for the game and help develop, then great. But if not, if if we have to err on the side of one or the other, then my organization declares success or determines success by the development of the players. Now, another situation, you may have more pressure to win or more pressure to develop coaching staff or whatever it is. You know, you got to understand your goal. And my goal is to develop the, the young individuals. So, you know, we want to use that opportunity for such. And and I, I've been there. I'm a dad with daughter who plays. And I'll say, how many shots did you get today? And she's like, you know, we did all running and drills and I took five shots at practice. Well, how are you going to get become better shooter, you know? And, you know, I've definitely been there. So, you know, that's, that's just like I said, a way that we use here. I'm not saying it's the best way, but it is our way. Well, I love it. And uh, I'm fighting the good fight for all of us, coach, to try and get more people playing basketball and getting more shots and stuff. But talk to us. Is it individual development within team concepts or is it just individual development or is it team connection? What type of things are you doing in those development periods? Well, like I said, it's player specific. Some players it may need to be, you need to focus on just spacing and how your game interacts with the team right? Instead of just your individual skill acquisition. For some players, they just have to acquire certain skills to be better or to impact winning. But basically, you know, I feel like the greatest development, like I already said, is impacting winning and how you can help the team do that. Because I think that translates through every every level. So it's we try to make it player specific. And, you know, so the answer, I guess, is both, right? The easy way. I took the easy way out. Well, it's good. And it's true. I mean, at the same time, I mean, you're trying to get them ready to play a game, but also to develop and those things go by hand in hand, in my opinion, as well. And talk to us a little bit about how, how you organize your staff then in terms of those pregame moments, the role of the assistant coach in creating a pregame atmosphere, environment and all the different things that they do. Well, initially, you know, it's it's not just for game day, but we we follow some core values. And I think some of them, you know, I, I got a uh, a laundry list of cliches, right? Shout praise, whisper criticism, and PMA, positive mental attitude, and uh, vibe projects. And so I think we're all responsible for the environment that we work in and to create for create for the players to grow in. And so I encourage the staff to kind of live by some of those principles. And so pregame is typically a time where they'll show video, you know, could be from practice or the previous game where they have some alone time with the player as well. And so even how we communicate in, in the video, I'm trying to do at least three positive clips to one negative clip and try to enforce or or um, try to encourage the behavior that you want instead of just repeatedly talk about the negative things, right? That's something I, we're going to try to emphasize even more. Uh, I think as far as the individual work that the player we meet as a staff and talk about, you know, what do you think the player needs? How can this player take a step forward individually, but also have greater impact on the team? It and also understanding, have a better understanding of the player's role, whether it's this is a player who's just trying to get on the floor, or this is a player who's trying to stay on the floor, or this is a player who's trying to uh, is somebody who's a high uses player who wants to create advantages for themselves and others and become more efficient. Right. So having all those understandings and then and then trying to create the best plan for the individual, I think, is is the goal where we're trying to be. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, of course. I mean, coaches love core values and, you know, and those <laughs> things are obviously true. And going you you mentioned kind of like it's it's a typical day. It's a typical thing that a lot of coaches do. But you've already mentioned a few differences within that. And I'm grateful for you sharing that. I'm curious now coming to kind of scattering report, which is obviously a big part of pregame, whether it's the day before, the day of, the walkthroughs. Can you take us through some of the procedures that you go through in terms of ensuring that your players get the necessary information you want out of a scattering report to be able to go into a game? Ultimately for us, I believe, you know, first I want to communicate the team's identity. Like who are they? How do they score, right? Secondly, what has, I tell the coaches, what has your nervous system? I don't want to just see the frequency plays that they run. You know, there's certain things I believe our team should be able to guard without us telling them or else we haven't prepared them. You know, a simple side pick and roll. If we can't, we we shouldn't have to put that on the scout for you to know how to guard that, right? So typical things that may have your nervous system. It's like, oh, because of our defensive system, 
this may be tricky. Or, you know, when this player does this, this might, you know, become problematic. So we talk about those things. So that means you have to know your team pretty well as well, right? As far as in the scouting report and what we show the team. Besides that, obviously we show our player personnel clips and we're showing tendencies and we may communicate how to guard the player as well, showing that on the video. And um, trying to keep it as simple, try to keep it as simple and as memorable as we can. I don't want to give too much information to where you remember anything, but I want to give enough information where you feel prepared. So there's a fine line to do that. So I sometimes believe, you know, what was it? My friend Janeiro always said, less is always more. Less is more, but more is always more. So you got to figure out which one you need at the moment, right? Less is more, but more is always more. And, and so we're very, I, I try to be strategic about how much information they get. And then there's some things that the coaches may need to know that the players don't need to know. And we can make decisions without the player having to think about it, where they're just executing what we tell them without having to understand or process all the information that we give them. I love the way you've outlined this. And you you got me curious at the end when you said some of the things the players don't need to know. So can you highlight maybe an example of that, that something the players don't need to know, but that you need to know as a staff? For example, we may say the way we help off of certain players or certain team. You know, we could just say, if this is a bad shooting team, we say, hey, we're going to shift more and be in the gaps more. We don't have to say this person can't shoot, this person can't shoot. Perhaps so they're wondering when they're closing out, which guy is it? Is it short? Is it long? No. All right. When we're in this set, everybody, we're going to take a step closer, shrink the floor, playing gaps. And it might be longer closeouts, but we're more comfortable. Or we're more focused on protecting the paint, you know, without every little detail. And some might ask and some, but just to make it simple and clear, Sometimes it may be something as simple as that. I love it. That's a collective collective understanding of what needs to be done. It's beautiful. And take us through, maybe if you could, when you do get a game day, walk through, shoot around, whatever it is, can you take us through a little bit of the segments of that you include in that game day situation? Well, first and foremost, being a former player, maybe I don't like game day walkthrough. Mm. <laughs> you know, I'm in a league that's younger and we we can use that, like I said, that time to help them grow i think part of it is also developing their basketball iq and understanding and also we have to invest because we only have you know was it eight or nine days before our first game in the g league we have to still build habits primarily early in the season and so we use that time to also still build our habits and build who we are and in, but ultimately i i like to spend a lot of time on ourselves i feel like we want to be the best version of ourselves you know, we'll talk about the team at the end of practice, but we're still going to invest in ourselves and in what we do, what makes us great. I don't believe you can be great if you're changing for every team, you know. So we stick to a lot of what we do, some core principles, core values, like you said. And we just become really good at it. And we plan for certain situations and we have schemes for certain situations that we can drill that uh, won't be a surprise to our players. But ultimately... I love to involve shooting on game day, team shooting, just because, you know, I always, I want to continue not thinking for that day, but for every jump shot that you invest, it may be two weeks later where you'll see the fruit of that work. And so I love, I love to shoot early and I love to do things together as a team because it connects us. You know, some people like stations or breakdown drills or separate, do individual work, but I want us to be connected. And I believe a team that's together will perform a lot better than a team that may know a lot, but, you know, have different views or maybe different agendas. I, I always say, you know, it's better for us all to be together and be wrong than some of us be right and some of us be wrong and be split. So I, I think of our drills, a lot of them are together, you know, maybe only using half the court, but we're all there and communicating and engaging with one another. I think there's value in that. Also, as far as the team, I don't generally, because there's always, you know, circumstances, I don't prefer to walk through a whole bunch of the team's plays. I prefer the concepts 
You know, I also, you know, a lot of times I wonder, depends how they score. Do the, I believe more often it's not plays that score, but players score. So what situations are the players in where they have more success? And it's typically after the play. Because if there was one play you can draw up and you score every time, every somebody, we would steal it and we'd all run it, right? And so it's typically the play after the play. So what are some things, what are some tendencies that they do after, you know, they run the back screen, down screen, and then you catch it and you guard that well? What's what's after that? What are some of their tendencies after that? And let's put our players in certain situations like that so they're they're understanding, you know, where they are on the floor, what they want to take away, what we're willing to live with. And, and then also just being more comfortable knowing that they'll be in these actions and this is how I'm ready to guard it. Okay, so a lot you said there. And I see how this connects back to what you've already shared with us, which is great. You know, some of these ideas around, look, if we don't know how to cover the wing ball screen, then, you know, the scouter report is <laughs> not going to highlight it. And I couldn't agree more. And I'm imagining that connects back to you as a player as well about some of these things that you saw as a player you know, maybe walk through shoot arounds, et cetera, that just, you know, like you didn't find as much value to. And I'll just say this quickly. I have eliminated a lot of game day walkthroughs and shoot arounds and stuff because of talking to players and them basically telling me how little they valued those. And they thought they could prepare themselves better in a different way. And we went to that. So I'm curious, what was your reasoning as a player for not liking them? I just remember being in the game and they teams would run actions and I wouldn't be like, Oh, they're running eye low. And I'm like, oh, this is a flared down screen middle balls. I'm not calling it out when I play. Like I I didn't remember. Maybe I wasn't the smartest player, but you're not in real time remembering the action. Like, you know, remembering if you give a whole bunch of plays. Now, if there's a sideline out of bounds or something that's tricky, okay, those happen less frequent. But in the action, so when I real when I really thought about that, I said, let's just give them the concepts. And let them walk through it and we can hopefully take less time as well. I, I really value, I try to show that I value the team's time, players' time. And so I I like to think that they engage more because they know I respect their time. And so I don't want to waste time. And we want to, you know, use the time wisely and that our work will be fruitful, right? These are all words that I say often. And so I just feel like we can get more out of other things for our guys and seeing the fruit from more than other things, you know, you can get play calls and you can tell the players, the names and all that. But, you know, besides a few who are really sharp, I don't think the whole team's remembering it. I just don't. I consider some of the things you're saying, common sense. Some others might consider them <laughs> divergent. Right. Consider yourself a little divergent with some of these ideas. Perhaps, you know, just because it's not what's always done. You know, I think sometimes we can become creatures of habit in, you know, I really try to draw from my playing experience and, you know, I, like, for example, you know, I don't like long video because when I was a player, I was the guy who struggled to stay awake in video, you know, <laughs> and I believe more than you can make the clips show whatever you want them to show. You can tell a story. And so I'm more concerned about what the players are walking out of that room saying collectively than, oh, when you're this play, you got to be here. When is that play? You got to be here. For sure. We have to do that. But the messaging is so much more important to me and what the group is walking away thinking, because, you know, now this is my tangent. Right. But there have so many voices, right. Agents, players, front office, parents, big brother, whoever it is, college coach, high school coach. So many voices after one game or after one practice or whatever on what they're thinking. So I love to mess use the video to message them and use that room to message the group. And to unite the group, because when we're all on the same page, communication erases mistakes, it eliminates confusion. So when I communicate a certain message, then that can unite us. And I believe competing together in us united is the greatest victory and greatest responsibility of a coach than whether they can guard the side balls. I love that approach, coach. And I always said, you know, like practice was the best team cohesion activity we ever did. Like practice is a time to build team cohesion. And to me, you've taken it a step further and basically said video is a time to get this collective mindset, this collective together. And I love that approach and that kind of, you know, way of thinking, because again, it does get to more purposeful. You said fruitful, love that more fruitful things <laughs> for your players, doesn't it? 
I, well, I hope so. You yeah. know, <laughs> I definitely don't have it all figured out, but you know, I'm, you know, leaning into this philosophy now that it's going to be my third year. And I think we, you know, we took a step last year and obviously all, G League, all the players have changed, but I'm more convinced going into my third year. Well, it's also why we run this podcast, so we can hear different perspectives, and it's beautiful to hear. Coach, we talked about pregame, we talked about scatter report, and now let's get into kind of in-game. Give us a little bit of perspective on some of the things. Let's maybe start with your game day card. Do you have one? And if you do, Very much so. what type of things are on it? Sometimes multiple, honestly. But typically, game day card is, you know, you do your offensive scout. I try to plays that I think will work against their defense, obviously, where we may see some holes in their defense. So typically that off the bat, I love to have some end of game situational type plays on there that, you know, that's, I just heard other people did it. So I did it and it's, it's, it's proved to be beneficial. And sometimes I'll have something written on there. Like my first year, I, I, I was really disappointed in myself at the end of a game because uh, it was a hectic game. The refs, you know, it was a lot of tension. And they came to the bench and I was screaming and I was so pumped up. And, you know, the player in me came out, whatever. But I believe calm is contagious. And I have to communicate calm to settle the room. And I believe when you do that, it also can uh, give the players confidence. And so sometimes I might have, have a note on there as well, you know, for different times. A note to yourself? Perhaps, or a phrase, could be anything. Also, something to keep me in the moment. Now, that's not a typical thing, but I may have that. Also, you might have your lineups, like best defensive lineup, best offensive lineup, best rebounding lineup. You might have some things like that for late game or for certain situations. You know, you might have your, your, you know, whatever whatever you think may come up in the game, you know, tip, like typical other coaches, it's... I may throw it on there for for that situation. Or it might just be situational because your team goes through different ups and downs through the season, right? And certain things may work at the moment, certain things may not. And, you know, so whatever I, I, I feel like I can use or that I need to remember that can jog my memory of anything, then I'm going to put it on that card. Love it. And talk to us maybe now the game started. Talk to us about in-game adjustments. Talk to us about that in the context of saying, what is the process for possibly implementing an adjustment if necessary? Um, For making changes in the game, I think it's what's hurting us, you know, what what's being, what's problematic. Have we, is it a problem with our execution or is it a problem with our strategy? Because sometimes it may be, we we have a coverage, they're just not executing the coverage well, you know? And so is it, do we need to substitute because to put someone in who's going to execute the coverage or do I need to time out and show my teeth a little bit, as they say? <laughs> or is it, man, they're really destroying this coverage and we need to change. And then we have a couple that we, you know, would typically try to go to. And, you know, we, it's, you know, throwing mud at the wall sometimes. <laughs> sometimes you're like, hey, give me anything. I'll try anything right now, right, to stop the bleeding. So I think you just have to determine whether is it is it an execution thing or is it just they're just really good at what they're executing, you know. And the G League, I mean, many coaches have mentioned this and you've kind of already mentioned this, the adaptive nature of the G League rosters change from game to game, from, from, you know, from location to location. So does that make it more likely to be to have to make adjustments within the game or is it less likely because you really can't do as much because your players maybe not be as in tune with what you're trying to do? Honestly, I believe it's the coaches, I guess what you're up to for is your comfortability with your guys, your trust of your guys, and the willingness, the risk taking with, I, I feel so much more free to try things than, for example, Coach Donovan, because it's not going to be all over ESPN, and I'm not going to have to get <laughs> judged on every single thing I do. But I remember a game I installed a zone at in a timeout. Like we're going to go zone after this timeout. You stand here. You stand here. We're gonna. Here's how we're gonna go to ball string. Let's go. Go play. You know, and and so. But I had certain trust level with some of the guys to be able to execute. And I knew that regardless, they were a team who scrambles and they would react to breakdowns, even if there was a breakdown. And so it just depends on your team, 
depends on your willingness to take risks. And then also, I believe you can practice it. You know, like I started, you know, a different ATOs or different times in the game. Hey, we're going to be in this coverage. Not because the team did anything, but we just want to throw a wrinkle at them or just let them see something different, you know. And, and sometimes it may be, oh, we got two bigs out there. You know, we're going to start three. We're going to throw three bigs out there and then crash the glass and see how they respond to it. You know, and if it, if it doesn't work, OK, well, we can recover, you know, the first three minutes of the game, you know, throughout the course of a game. Right. So it's up to your risk factor as well up to your wrist faster and you know that's obviously must be part of the fun of coaching at that level is that you can try some stuff and that's very common in Europe too isn't it where a lot of coaches are very much willing to throw different things out there to just try and find a way right in terms of that so do you enjoy that part of it I well honestly part of my mission here is to I hopefully I can tie this together influence the organization upwards Mm. I really I really love this league and the opportunity I have in it and we have a unique opportunity to where we can try things. And if something does work, I would love to be able to bring it to Coach Donovan and the staff who've invested so much in me and say, hey, you know what? This worked. You guys should think about trying this. Here's some video. Or I asked the analytics department, hey, is there anything you're wondering about? Is there anything we could try that maybe, you know, we can get some data for the big team? And we tried certain things. And it's just as simple as that as well. Like I, I challenge our coaches in our first meeting to think outside the box. Don't just come with the answers you've already heard because then we'll truly be able to influence our organization upwards and maybe help our players, but also help the big club in you know driving some success and moving the needle forward and something we can do. That's awesome. What a great answer. And uh, I love that part of that uh, a process for you and uh, the whole organization. Curious, because we've talked about this a little bit from your player perspective. I'm curious what you think of halftime as a player and now as a coach. What type of things do you value at halftime for your team to be successful? I value at halftime. It's always, you know, it's always something that's always done, but we want to communicate. I try to make the team talk at some moment. Like sometimes I'll come in and just say, hey, what's working? So they can verbalize it. And I think when they do that and they process that, then it helps them to, hey, all right, well, let's stick with this. You know, I'll say, what are some things maybe we're struggling or what are we not doing well? Because I believe a lot of times they have the answers to the test. They just don't apply it. And I just actually, that was one of my messages in video, right? Knowledge is having the information or knowing the facts, but wisdom is being able to apply it is what I told them. And it, like knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing that you shouldn't put it in a fruit salad. Right. And so. There's plenty of guys who I know that one. <laughs> plenty of guys who know the pick and roll coverage, but all us coaching staff know the pick and roll coverage, but most of us can't apply it. But they're in a situation where they have the ability to apply it. It's just whether or not they will. And so now I'll ask them, you guys have the answers to the test. If this is hurting us, what do we need to do? You know? And a lot of times one of the players will speak up and they'll have an answer, but it gets them communicating. And I believe communication brings them together. Communication, communi it shows care. And communication is ultimately going to eliminate the mistakes. And then obviously there's some things I may see and I'll, I'll show them or I'll communicate, hey, when you're in this situation, think about this. Or when you're in this situation, we'll guard this. But it's just a, a brief moment. But I, I like to unite us get them talking, get them refocused on being together, communicating well, and then challenge them to start well. I believe, you know, the first and third, you know, are some critical times in the game, how you start. And and so I, I like to challenge them in that way. So I'm curious now, so you've talked to your team, you engaged your team, I love that. And now they're going to go back onto the court. You mentioned what you like pregame a little bit in terms of development. Is there a similar process at, uh, when they get back on the court after halftime or what type of things do you encourage or do you like to see from your players when they come back onto the court? Well, I just want them to be ready to play, whatever it is to be ready to play. So, you know, we'll bring them to, you know, they'll, they'll do their warm up if they need it. If not, I'll let that be their time. You know, because a lot of emotions, some people need to calm down, whatever it is. And then and then it's, you know, I'm talking to them about refocusing them to be to compete together, to be hard and to play smart, obviously. And then, you know, let's start the start the right way. Hopefully we throw the first punch in the halftime. 
Love it. And I'm sure your players value that as well. I mean, too often we try and I feel like fit players into this mold of this is what you have to do. This is your pregame. This is your halftime. But as you mentioned already, players are are, are a proven biology. They're individuals. They're not uh, the same as everyone else. And that gives them space to be that. Is there anything else you can think of as a coach that, you know, that can help players be themselves and be able to be themselves within a certain space? Yeah, that is every practice, every huddle, I try to give them room to speak, but only because I believe you can't really go to war with someone if you don't know each other. And then ultimately I'm trying this year to, in video, give each guy five minutes, share something that's important to you. And I started it off. And I believe when you get to know them and their perspective, it makes it a lot easier to connect with them. And I believe if you connect off the court, it's easier to connect on the court and also believe the best. You know, I, I also have them determine how they want to handle adversity. My one of my, my second meeting every year is, you know, in, in whatever it comes up, I always do a PowerPoint. And at some point it comes up, adversity will come. So how are we going to handle it? You know, and then I have them, you know, they may shout out, oh, we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to communicate, you know, we're going to stay together. We're going to, you know, not argue. We're going to, wh whatever they choose. And, and then I hold them accountable to it. Like, Hey, this is a moment of adversity, you know, but I think when they get to know each other and then when they, and you can hold them accountable to the things that they say about the adversity, I think those are some things that really help in game for, for me great part of leadership is making it seem like their idea, right? In terms of yeah, very much this so. is this is your yeah. idea. I'm just doing what you all asked me to do for you. And that empowers you as a coach, but also obviously puts a responsibility on the players, which generally you find players enjoy that, don't you? I'm, I'm fortunate. We've had great guys, but we've had some pretty healthy atmospheres. So, you know, I, I really think you got to invest in culture. Like I said, when I started, it's the environment that we're all in, we're all responsible for it. And, and I think, you know, the players have enjoyed, you know, as far as exit interviews, that's what they're saying. You know, they've definitely enjoyed it. That's awesome. And so we're back. We're we're kicking butt after halftime. And, uh, you know, it comes down to the end of the game, a close game. And now we're in some of these end of game situations and special situations. And certainly at different levels, there's different rules. So beyond that, just maybe give, maybe give us an idea of how you prepare your team for some of these end of game scenarios that are possible. Oh, I mean, primarily, primarily practice. One thing I did last year that was fruitful was we would, even in, during training camp, we would watch end of games as a team in the NBA. And because I wanted to communicate how I see the, the game should be played at the end and communicate some of my ideas. So I remember last year we watched the Dallas game. I want to, I wonder who they would play. It might've been Phoenix. I'm not sure. But it was, you know, we watched the last three minutes and I would pause it and say, you know, what do you think here? Should we foul? Should we have a timeout? Should we, you know, and because it's not them, they felt more free to talk and judge someone else's decisions than ours. But I was able to communicate, see how they saw the world. And I was able to communicate my idea of, hey, at this point, I still want to run. At this point, we need to start thinking two for one. At this point, you know, we should probably be fouling, you know, if, you know, with, if they're not shooting at this point, we're, we, I would like to go one through five and switch everything. And so they're starting to see it, see the way, excuse me, see the way I see the game in with, while watching someone else. So that was one way in practice, you know, especially in the G league, they have the overtime rules, right? Games to seven. So we would play that. We would say, Hey, overtime game and the game is to seven and just going through the strategy of it. Okay. Well, it's five to four. It's, it, you know, and they got a chance to win it. They're down three. Do you foul? And just let them get two free throws. Do you play it out? You know, certain things like that. And getting, putting them in them, those situations so they're a little more comfortable, but also so they can just understand what I would, what I want. And so we're all on the same page. So talk to us about the Elam ending versus games to seven or to, to, to seven and talk to us about those different things. Cause you've been, you've experienced both, correct? Yeah. The Elam ending you mean in the showcase? Yeah. yeah. Well, that was unique because. Cause, cause now you decided I'm just, I should qualify that because the G league experimented with it, but then decided to go to this other version. So I'm just mm -hmm. curious your perspective. I very much dislike the Elam thing. Okay. Only because time is such a factor in the game. And 
going to the 25 plus, I think we had one quarter where our quarter was almost 30 minutes and we were playing and my guys were tired, but this is the end of the game where I would keep my high uses guys in and my end of game rostering, but they were so tired that I felt like it hurt us, but also we were more of a defensive team. Right. And I felt like we got punished because we couldn't score as much as some other teams, but because we could get enough stops until the clock ran out, that's that's t- taken away from us because we had to score the 25 instead of just keep them from scoring more than us. You know, so I, I didn't like that as well. But ultimately, like we said, there's no time management. That factor of the game is out of it. And I think that's a huge part. So the game to seven, as far as overtime, I, you know, I think it makes the game go quicker. I still think there's some strategy in it. It's not too short, but it's not too long. So I think I, I really, I really think the G League did some found something with it. I'm, I'm not mad at that idea. Yeah, it's cool, and I do think again to challenge these different end game type of ways that we play it is wonderful. And uh, you know, hopefully, again, this is something that's tried and true and comes into basketball because this stereotypical five minutes doesn't always seem to produce the best type of quality in the the overtime as well. And the one thing about an Elam ending is it does produce quite a bit of excitement. And I'm imagining, yeah. that, right, the games of seven do that too. And, yeah, and there's always somebody who has to hit a game winner, right? Yeah. That's really what they want, right? And but it's not 25. It's, you know, seven quick points. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm yeah, that's okay cool. What, what in your opinion is the most challenging thing for a coach to be able to, you know, navigate in an end of game situation for you personally as a coach? Most challenging thing to navigate end of game. Ooh. In the G League, sometimes you have minutes requirements. And if you have an assignment player down or whatever, and positionally, maybe, they're struggling, you know, but partially because, you know, not to say the assignment's not good, but they may have been with the big club and haven't played for two weeks or three weeks and they get sent down to get minutes. And a lot of times they're not in the best shape, but a lot of times, you know, sometimes they're just out of rhythm and you have to play them, you know? So sometimes those are problematic to try and, you know, get them their usage or get them their minutes and still, you know, do what's best for the team. I think also as far as me, uh, really trying to manage the timeouts when your team is not doing great or not doing bad, where it's, okay, you just got a turnover. You're thinking to get a timeout. Well, they just turned it back over to us because you got a good defensive stop. And then, okay, you made a layup, they hit a three, and then, you know, you missed two shots in a row and they made it, they made a three, you want a timeout, but then they get a steal and then they, <laughs> so they do just enough to where it's like, you don't want to stop them. Right. So that, that, that space is navigating. And they're like, well, you're going to lose your timeout in the last three minutes, you know, that type of thing. Uh, I think another situation is what the, the strength of your team in the moment because you know your guys, but if there's foul trouble, if there's anything. One game, I, I feel like I let my team down. We had a baseline out of bounds. We had a chance to win the game. Plenty of time, maybe seven, eight seconds, you know, time to actually draw a play and do something. But my team was, at the time last year, wasn't great baseline out of bounds. And I had a timeout where I could have just time out, used the timeout, put it on the sideline. We were much better, significantly better, I think, executing from the sideline. And and also just the spacing and the positioning of where the person who I wanted to get the ball typically would have more success, you know? So I think knowing the team in that regard and knowing their strengths and weaknesses for certain situations that they're put in and just being able to call it that at that moment, you know, it's a lot to think about a lot of other things going through your man, but I feel like I let us down just cause Hey, I could have used that timeout, put it on the sideline, put the ball in my guard's hand in space, let him create and take us home. You know, we had the MVP last year, right? And he ended up having to catch it in a location on the floor where analytically is proven that it wasn't going to be the highest value shot. And also he was limited to what he could do because of the location on the floor. He received the ball. So I, I definitely took that one. Well, we're getting great knowledge and great introspection on this podcast. So thank you, coach. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I never would have thought about that minute situation. That's, that's when you, I've heard people talk about the minutes, but I haven't heard it in that context. So that totally makes sense. But I also see sometimes like coaches stick with 
a group possibly too long, let's say in an overtime period. And they're kind of just, they're comfortable. So they go with them and they're unwilling to kind of maybe adapt, you know, different personnel or stuff like that. And that's another really hard thing to overcome, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and you know, some people, I I believe some of this, that is your philosophy, Mm -hmm. right? Are you going to go with the players that got you the lead back? Maybe you bench two of your starters and then they make a run. And then at the end of the game, are you going back with your starters? Are you going with the guys who's playing well, right? So some of that is philosophy, but also, like you said, maybe you just found a good group who's gelling together. Nobody played bad. And then it's like, all right, they've been going six minutes straight, seven minutes straight. And now it's three minutes left in the game. Do you let them go 10 minutes straight when the fatigue could be a factor? Or do you get someone in and out, you know? So really trying to determine that. And I think part of that is just knowing your team, knowing who you're going to sub in. If they if they can, if they're going to be erratic, if they're going to be calm, are they going to steady the ship? Or are they somebody who's going to, for good or for bad, have such a great impact that you, it's going to be unstable, right? I think a lot of that is knowing your team and knowing, knowing you know, their characteristics. Absolutely. And uh, coach, let's say you won the game. You won the game. What's happening? Yeah, there you go. What What's happening post game? And I guess going with that question, and I'm assuming there's not necessarily, but what's different if you lost the game? I'm glad you said that. I'm because I was a player, I get in some of my experiences in Europe, I always say we're the same. So if we play music on the bus on the way home after a win, play it when we lose. And, you know, some guys are down or whatever I said. You know, I try to lead the way in that. So it may may be killing me inside, but hey, I might get on the bus and make a joke right away just to deflate in the mood because I say, okay, the problems that we had happen in between the lines and we'll fix them when we get in between the lines and we'll fix them when we watch video. But you don't have to walk around like it's a funeral or be sad in front of the coaches because we lost. No, be the same. And I believe we got all have a reason to be grateful no matter what situation we're in. So keep your attitude and gratitude, keep your heads up and uh, we'll get better. We'll find a way to get better when we get in between those lines. So winning and losing, there's not much. I try to make it not much different as far as how we react. And, but obviously you might, it's easier. It's just a little easier to smile after a win but we're still going to go through our process. We're going to watch video, see if we can improve. And, you know, we're going to communicate to our guys, make sure they rest and take care of themselves, you know, and keep it simple. I One thing I learned is you don't want to say too much, you know, win or loss until you watch it because you don't want to have to apologize or correct yourself later. I was going to mention that part of it. We've had some college coaches on here that do never meet with their team after a game for partly that reason, that they'd rather the first talk to the team is that they have the analytics, they have the support of the video, and they're saying the things that actually will impact, say, the improvements or whatever it may be. How do you feel about that? Well, let me put my dukes up. (laughs) Fight, fight, fight. I disagree in some respects, especially in a professional level, only because of the voices. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to do media or if they're going to go home, talk to their agents, you want to shape their thinking a little bit and give them something to give the media, you know, because one player, if you don't, if they don't know, they can be like, oh, well, our bigs didn't rebound tonight or, oh, we didn't do this. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Or the referees were terrible. No, the reason we lost is we didn't get back in transition defense. We didn't move the ball. We only had 10 assists and you know what I mean? Or whatever it is. So I like to give them something that they can go away with because so many of their parents, friends, agents, high school, college code, whatever, are going to feed them information that I like to give them something from our coaching staff perspective. I like that perspective as well. And especially, again, if you talk about younger players or stuff like that. But I know you already referenced having kids. Sometimes those post games go way too long. And I just know that my mm-hmm. daughters way too long. Yeah, like they're not processing any of that <laughs> after the game. They just want to have you know, move on to the next or obviously get a snack or do something else. And, you know, that's part of the challenge of all those different levels is there's different things. So if you were to put on your youth coaching hat, what would be, you talked about the ref referencing the collective Mm -hmm. needs of everyone, but what are we, what's one of the main things that we need to communicate after a game that can help someone move on to their next game? Oh, wow. After a game in youth, let them know. I, I'm big for youth sports. It's, it's got to be fun. So I'm, you know, you know, coach their effort, 
right? You got to coach their effort, let them know if they, they did a good job. But I say, you know, continue to be positive and say, hey, you know, be ready for the next one. But I'm not, you know, I got different philosophies with youth sport like, until they love it. And I always tell them it's not a job for you. It's a job for me. It's for my kids. And so you're, we're going to continue to learn. We're going to continue to grow. Here's some positive things that we did. Here's an area where we may need to grow, right? Give them the sandwich, right? Positive area of growth, another positive, you know, let's, let's bring it in and be ready to go the next time. You know, that's, that, that's how I would think of youth sports and just make sure that everyone is enjoying sports, just enjoying the moment. Well, coach, we'll have to have you on to have a whole conversation at some point when you have more time to talk about youth sports, that will be fun for both of us. So we'll do that. <laughs> that would be great. I would enjoy that. Henry, this has been fabulous. And, uh, you know, I, I saw that like, there was very little time between you being a player and you becoming a coach. And I'm curious, maybe your perspectives on that. And, you know, just as you move forward and now you're head coach of a G League team. Oh, well, I mean, I was playing and I got hurt. I wanted to come back, but obviously I was 36 at the time. So father time was telling me it was time to go. And I was fortunate enough through relationships to get opportunity in you know the Boston organization. And I didn't know you know, as a player, when it's coming to an end, that's a whole nother podcast. It's a, one of the most difficult times in your life, right? Not many people have to deal with retirement and try to start something new. And as a, as a, once I was fortunate with the relationship to get in that organization, I, I jumped at it and didn't know anything about coaching and not even sure I wanted to coach, but I knew I wanted to be around the game because I love the game. And then I was, you know, I'm so grateful that I, I was around a good organization, good people who invested in me. And now I can't believe I'm already a coach, head coach for three years. Never thought I was even going to be an assistant. So I'm fortunate, I'm definitely fortunate for that. And, you know, well, we're grateful. fortunate as well that we got a chance for you to share with us. And coach, I know we worked hard to make this happen. So I just want to personally thank you for that too, because you stuck with me, I stuck with you and we got this done and everyone's better for it now. So thank you. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I, I I know you had to stick with me. I, I know my communication was poor, but I'm grateful that we were able to do this. I listened to your show. I actually listened to two of your podcasts this week. I got a long commute, so it's easy. You're, you're I've been listening to you a lot this week, actually, but I've been listening to you previously. You're one of my favorite basketball podcasts, actually, to listen to. I've actually sent you your podcast to my daughter's AAU coach. You know, so I've spread it, spread it, spread it around. So I'm just, it's only right that I give back. That's what I'm trying to say. That's a long winded answer, but it's only right that I give back because you've been investing in me as a coach and hopefully I was able to share something that helps someone. Absolutely. And I appreciate that. And keep sharing it, coach. Keep sharing it. Appreciate that. Awesome.